Hey everybody, John Borchine here, and this is Cable Lane. I want to welcome you back to our series, Experiencing God Day by Day. In today's study, it's entitled, Blameless. Listen to these words. There was a man in the land of Uts whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. What an incredible title. Now, when someone is called blameless, what does that mean? Does that mean that they're sinless? Well, no, of course not. We all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. Even the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 24 addressed the fact that he wanted no regrets. He wanted to handle each and every situation rightly. And that's ultimately what being blameless is all about, that you are one who there is no accusation against. You're an individual of strong moral character, an individual of integrity. So how do we become that kind of person, a person that is blameless? Well, firstly, there is the blood of Jesus Christ that atones for our sins, that covers us, and he imparts upon us righteousness. So we have the righteousness of Christ upon us as we stand before the holy God. But then there is the way that we handle and conduct ourselves in the everydayness of life. When we sin, not if, when we sin, we need to handle it correctly. Rather than trying to conceal it or justify it or just pretend that it never happened, we need to deal with it firstly with God, and secondly, we need to handle it rightly with those whom we may have hurt. Because it's rarely, there's rarely a case where sin is isolated to the sinner only. In fact, I can think of hardly any sins that come to mind that doesn't impact somebody else. Even sins of the mind, sins of the heart. You can lust for somebody in your heart and not act out in that lust, and yet you've still sinned against the holiness of God. You have also sinned against your own moral character because you will act differently. Therefore, you will impact those individuals and the ones around you. And so all sin impacts everyone else around us. Your sphere of influence will be greatly impacted by sin. So we need to know how to handle these things rightly. Let me take you then to 1 John chapter 1. This one comes to mind. Verse 9 is very critical in this. Listen to these words. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a powerful reminder. Sometimes we think that once we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that his forgiveness has now covered all sin, and indeed it has, but it doesn't mean that it takes away the responsibility for us to still deal rightly with him when we fall short. We know that we fall short, so therefore we must deal with it firstly with God. Now, secondly, he tells us in James chapter 5, verse 16, that we are to address these sins one to another and to pray for one another. So there's a responsibility before God and there's a responsibility to one another to confess these things. Why does all this matter? Well, it's because before the courts of heaven, your accuser stands there trying to accuse you of all of your wrongs, and you render him powerless when you deal with these matters rightly. Imagine going before a judge here on earth, and there's a person who wants to accuse you of wrongdoing. Imagine then going to that judge before that accuser ever arrived and telling that judge all the things you've done wrong and looking to the person who was wronged in the process and dealing with it rightly and humbly, respectfully. And then suddenly the prosecutor shows up, everything's already been dealt with. And that's what happens when we confess our sins before God and to the person. You have made Satan speechless. What a wonderful joy to make the enemy of our souls speechless. So render him powerless. Confess your sins before God and to one another. Then we have another responsibility that comes into this because not only are we going to hurt someone else, most likely you also will be hurt by someone else. How do you handle that? When that person comes and seeks forgiveness, we have a responsibility according to the very words of Jesus Christ our Lord, who tells us in Matthew chapter 18 that we are to forgive 70 times 7. The image there is powerful because it goes back to Daniel chapter 9, in which there was a 490-year plan put together for the first and second coming of Jesus Christ. What he gives us this image of then is the very plan of God unfolded to redeem 
to save lost sinners, to give them hope and life eternal, that plan is to be basically implemented in our own lives as well. As we have been forgiven a debt that we could never repay, we are to say, I have the same heart, the same love, the same mercy that is given to another that we're able to forgive as we have been forgiven. That means when someone comes to us to seek our forgiveness, we have the responsibility to forgive, the joy to forgive, and then what? We must also forget. You cannot hold that wrong against them. We are told that our Lord forgets our sins, that when He removes our iniquities as far east is from the west, and you'll notice that that's an important image to get your mind wrapped around, as far east is from the west, never for the two to meet again, that when He forgives our sins, He also forgets our sins. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17 and Jeremiah 31, 34 talked about that, that he forgets we have the responsibility to do likewise. We so often want to hold on to the wrongs that someone has done against us as if to police them, to hold them accountable, to put a defense mechanism in place lest we be hurt again by that person. So we're not going to be so gullible the next time. We're going to make sure our defenses are up and maybe even remind them of how they have fallen short so that we don't get hurt again. Brothers and sisters, that is not agape love. We have got to trust Jesus Christ our Lord. We've got to trust God with the souls of men. When they hurt us, when they come against us, we must turn to God in these situations rather than trying to fix them, trying to make them right. We must trust God with them. We see for women even in 1 Peter chapter 3 that even without a word spoken by their humble countenance, a heart can be changed. I think that applies to all of us. Will we truly submit to God, make ourselves available, open our hearts to give the full love that we have also received, that we can forget even the trespasses that have been committed against us? That's a gift that we can give to others because we have been the recipients of a tremendous gift to have the slate wiped clean. And when we know that our sins have been forgiven like that, there is freedom in that. Imagine if couples could learn to forgive and forget like that, how their relationship would almost have a reset button, a great joy to know that I have been released of the debt against that person. When I know that I've hurt their heart, to know that when they have forgiven me, they have also forgotten. And we start afresh anew this day as we do with God the Father when we confess our sins, as we do when we go to a brother or sister whom we've offended or hurt in our sin. When we have sought their forgiveness, we get the reset button. It is a great joy. It's a liberation. It's a joy of the freedom that comes when we have rightly handled these situations. Listen to what Dr. Henry Blackaby says. Have you been blameless in your dealings with God and others? Have you failed to treat people as you should? Have you responded with integrity as you reconciled with them? If you are to be blameless, you must do everything in your power to correct any wrongdoing and reconcile any broken relationship. There is a profound sense of peace for the one whose way is blameless. I want to encourage you also with this. Another verse has come to mind, and I want to share this with you. Listen to the Apostle Paul's instruction to us here in Philippians chapter 2. He says here, starting in verse 14, do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of light. Brothers and sisters, we have a privilege to know God's Word, to extend God's Word as salt and light in this world, and it requires us to learn how to deal with sin rightly, with God and with other men. May God strengthen you to walk blamelessly before those who may observe you as an ambassador of Jesus Christ. God bless you, my friends. Take care.